This is Peter Wilson from the Industrial Noise and Vibration Centre, who's come along today to give us this uh, training. Um, I think it'd be really good if we could have lots of discussion in the second half of the day. I think there's some yeah. time in the, in the schedule for that. Um, you know, bring out your, your issues and your problems and, and, and have a chat about them. Thank you. Good morning. Um, it's hopefully it's a very practical session. And, um, this afternoon, I mean, presumably you're all here because you've got noise problems or someone told you that you need to find out about noise problems and so on. Um, this is engineering noise control, which talks about actually reducing noise levels. Um, I've been doing this for such a long time. Uh, and I find it unbelievably frustrating and depressing that in the last 40 years I've been involved in noise and vibration, nothing much has changed. People are still going deaf unnecessarily, and the technology and engineering for the control has moved on. But people don't use it. People don't know what best practice is. People make mistakes, and it's all avoidable. So what I'm going to talking about is, is, if you like, there's only one effective approach to noise control, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about. It's based on understanding the problems, and it's really an engineering problem. One of the big issues with health. With health and safety and noise, is that noise is always health and safety. Whereas as soon as you have know you've got a noise problem, it becomes an engineering problem. And I'm an engineer, so obviously that's where I get my blocks off to do engineering fixes for engineering problems. Um, we run uh, the, we developed and run the Irish Competency Training Course in Lewis, so we see a massive number of reports, uh, noise assessments from all across the country and all across the country. We probably see more reports than anybody other than the HSE. And the standard of competence in noise control is absolutely abysmal. <coughs> noise consultants write reports, and you see a bit about noise control, is to paraphrase, it'd be a really neat idea to work out some kind of way of reducing the noise. And it's more we talk about enclosures and silences without really understanding what the problem is. And that's extremely frustrating because that's a secret. That's a substantial, critical part of this learning, is to take away the risk if we can. Um, so, what I'd like to do first, though, is to go around the room and see how much experience you've got, where you're from, what you manufacture. So, um, we might start with Simon. So, I, I don't work on a manufacturing site, I, I work in our head office, sort of a central um, occupational hygiene or industrial hygiene resource, not in the lab. Uh, equipment there. Uh, I do do some of this stuff, but in fact, I have some going on as we speak. So, you're multitasking is very much. Oh, yes, I'm flat out. <laughs> um, I'm Benedict Wilson, um, and I <coughs> work for our, in our Scarsdale site, and um, we manufacture breathing apparatus. Um, so, lots of high pressure air um, being released and things like that. Um, and uh, ultrasonic welders, those, those kind of, those kind of things. <coughs> um, I'm David Crosby, I work with the Central Engineering Group. Uh, I've been with the group for about six months. Um, prior to that, I've been a project engineer, project manager for 25 years. And um, been quite a bit with specifying equipment and a lot of FATs where we look at uh, noise aspects of machinery and uh, try to engineer it that as well. So does 3M have a bi quiet policy? Yes. It doesn't work well. Right, it's not doors, but it doesn't seem to be the whole thing. This is an absolute classic. If you go, you know, if you go any group of engineers from a company, I do this quite a lot, um, you go, right, your noise buying policy. Half the people go nod, nod, the other half go, I didn't realise we've got one of those. That's part of the problem, which I'll talk a bit about later on as well. Um, because, yeah, I mean, if, you, if you're retrofitting noise control to production plant, the same <coughs> procedures you'd follow for new plant. So we used to have a policy of, um, of, of on the FATs <laughs> that pretty much should follow the new that's that's 76 to 80 is, is the normal range for your first take. Mm. It's going to hit that. It's not a problem. It's higher than that. Big Lo Chong, the EHS manager at Loughborough. So we manufacture pharmaceutical products. 
which obviously gives us a lot of um, problems when we start looking yeah, from a hygiene point of view, um, regulatory point of view, what we actually put in place to reduce noise. Um, and they're all sort of plastic boxes, the rooms are, so you may get a fairly quiet machine, but once it goes into that room, it's it, the noise, you know, it's quite difficult then to reduce it. Yeah. I'm Abigail Curtis <coughs> and I work up at Aircliff and we manufacture mainly half face respirators on site. Got a number of issues with a number of different machines. We've also got quite a lot of very old machines that we run. Um, we've got a number of different areas that have that we have to wear hearing protection in, and we're trying to reduce the areas that um, are over 80 decibels. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name's Iona, and I, I work with Abby at, at Eclash. So your name's Iona. Hi, I'm Michelle. I'm the industrial hygienist at Loughborough. So, because already already mentioned, we have a lot of reverberation in rooms, a lot of issues because of the GMP challenge types of materials we can use. Yeah. Um, we do try and put in a less than seventy four dB policy in our URSs, our user requirement specs, but typically they they never. Seventy four is very very low. Because uh, that's the sort of level that we are. Yeah. <laughs> but we try, but it never works. <laughs> so we do, yeah, very often. We've had some new equipment and, yeah, we, we've not hit the noise. One of the problems with setting noise specifications quite tight like that is that, um, as I've said, you can throw the hands up, that's not But also the other thing is that people spend an awful lot just in closes, which has effects on productivity and cleaning and hygiene and other knock on effects. So and clearance fun. we have to do, so you don't want anything sort of tucked away oh, anywhere. Yes. So yes. yeah. We do a lot of work in pharmaceutical food and and uh because our offices is half a mile from Mars south. So they always call us in for doing stuff. And <clears throat> um, Mars bars contain contain ten percent less chocolate than they used to because of me, so I am that basket. <laughs> <laughs> that was a noise and vibration control project. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Mark Cotton from KCI Industry Airport. I'm a manufacturing engineer and owner of automated, automated division. And likewise, similar issues with uh, ultrasonic welders. Uh, so what do you mean? Uh, we make um, negative pressure bandage. Uh, oh, yes, you said you yeah, had bandages. Yeah. So, just a similar issues with uh, GMP, uh, a lot of issues with electric welder or like ultrasonic welders. Yeah, that we don't want to control. So, we do not go for us to use issues with the kitchen and using that. Yeah, that's not true. Uh, Mark James, uh, maintenance engineer in 3M Designer. I uh, work in a extrusion and converting department, which is currently a man free view protection area. So I'm going to run my decks to be equipment. So a lot of gearboxes in there. Yes. Yeah. It's just transfer systems of the high popping stuff, which is quite easy. Um, uh, Mark Lewis, uh, what's it called Mark? Yeah, <laughs> more, yeah that, we had that thought process last night. Obviously, it's obviously <laughs> yeah. a big demand in 3M for 3M, is three marks. <laughs> 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 that was a good idea if you get it all set together. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> we look after the, the world plants uh, from the uh, agenda aspects. We have uh, this, uh, healthcare business in the left where we have uh, a lot of room for uh, recuperation, uh, ventilation bowls. Uh, Air transfer units, um, open airlines. Uh, recently gone through uh, some of the project off on noise reduction there. I had it um, scoped, should we say, which I want to report uh, moving through, which I should. Also, then obviously, the second part of the job is in the sign out, and uh, Mark's recently touched on all some type of uh, issues. Right, okay. <coughs> okay, pressing on. Uh, what I'm hoping to do is this afternoon is to spend some time going through the sorts of noise problems within the sites and applying some of the things I'm talking about. So hopefully you'll go away with some really good ideas <coughs> um, during the day. Um, oh, this is we clear tall building with a single bound. Um, so today, introduction, I'm going to go through just a very, very brief segment of the reg today and what the HSC is expect. So that's quite important. <coughs> um, we do join. Uh, 
workshops with the HSC to spread the word about noise control. And the HSC have got quite a problem on their hands because of a short of resources, but also they have to be very politically correct. You know, you, if um, I did the HSE roadshow, so launched the noise regulations, uh, the racial regulations, and we all toured the country and had about 25 seminars all around the country with noise regulations. And one of the big problems with your HSE inspector is whatever you say, we take that context and use it against you. You have to be so careful. So the reason they got me on it was because I don't have to be politically correct. I can say, no, that doesn't work. It's terrible. It's a useless idea. Um, and that's part of the problem, is it's the agency has to be so careful what they say. Um, whereas I don't. So I shan't. Um, we talk about noise terminology because one of the big problems with noise is that people misunderstand what it, what it means. So just very briefly, very pragmatically going through uh, the parts of noise terminology you need to understand when you're looking at noise control and the way sound behaviours behave. So when you get the reverberation, why and how and what frequencies and the rest of it. Um, <coughs> And then launching into the key key part, which is the attitude to noise and the diagnostic process. The diagnostic process is the key. Because if you understand it, you've got a good chance of having engineering control techniques that actually control the noise and source. Because one of the big frustrations with noise control is that most people just consider blocking the path, which is enclosures, lagging, silences and things like that without considering the alternatives. And the trouble with those is, especially in high hygiene industries, is you're using materials like rock wool and fiberglass which traditionally and foam, which you just can't use in high hygiene environments. So, <clears throat> um, and then loads of examples and how to approach noise and what the options are in terms of the techniques and technology you can use, purchasing policy and a substantial group discussion. I've got one problem that was forwarded in advance, which is optional welding, which applies to some of you. Um, so I've got an example of that uh, and any others you can come up with during the day. <clears throat> First off, the regulations. Um, basically, they kick in 80 dBA. That's 80 dBA 8 hour dose, which is an LEAV, low exposure action value. So that's an average over a day of 80 dBA. Now, the key thing you need to understand about noise is that noise is energy and what this means is the risk of hearing damage is directly proportional to that noise energy going to the ears per day. So you look at the dose, how much energy per day, 80 dBA for eight hours, is where you have advisory hearing protection and where you have to start doing other things like information, signs, etc. etc. Et At 85 dBA, it's mandatory PPE. Um, and also audiometry tips in, and you also you must look at that noise control. <coughs> <coughs> um, mandatory PPE means everybody. One of the big misunderstandings I'm just walking through. So I don't need to put your attention on. Well, you do, because you, that's the approach you do. Everybody in that area must wear PPE. No matter how long you're in there for. Signs need signs. <coughs> There's also the exposure limit value, which is 87 dBA. The 80 and 85 are just in the environment in which you're working. The limit value is often misunderstood. This is the noise level inside your PPE. So it's extremely rare to exceed that because that means the noise level outside must be way over 100, averaged over a day. So that is the noise level inside your hearing protection. So it's including your exposure without hearing protection on and with your hearing protection on. So it's quite rare, but some people get very worried by this saying, oh, it's not 87, therefore I can It's inside the hearing protection, so it's extremely rare to use those sorts of things. What sort of noise levels have you got in your noise hazard zone to average over a day between things? So you know roughly. I think quite a lot of your places is high 80s, mm. not 95 to 100. No, a lot of it's under 85. In your areas, you might have 90s. Yeah, at certain points. Yeah. Um, but most of the rest of you probably, from my experience, probably high 80s, as it's expected. Um, so none of you are really going to have a problem with ELB, so think about that. Now, rule of thumb, 95 dose per day is what we regard as the effective limit for easy protection using PPE. In other words, you've got 
that's requiring 10 to 15 dB of attenuation. Now, hearing protection gives, can give you much higher levels than that, but it's the way people wear it. And with 3M do fit testing. And if you fit test a load of people, you'll find some of them sit at their earplugs so badly that they're only getting 3 or 4 dB of attenuation, when you should, in theory you should be getting 20 plus. And that's the problem. So we have a rule of thumb, if you need more than about, the noise level is more than 95, you, you've got problems. You have to be very careful, you have to do fit testing, you have to do a lot of training, you have to do a lot of um, evaluating how people are wearing them and how often they're wearing them and if they're wearing them properly and all the rest of it. Hmm. Um, above that, you just have to be careful. It's very hard to guarantee quite easily. For impulses, single, single impacts, it's peak noise. All the rest of these levels are DBA, and I'll talk about what that means. Um, the peak level is just the peak pressure. Instantaneous pressure pulse going to ears. 135 dB is where mandatory peak we, um, should kick in. Technically, in the regulations, it says 135 dB peak advisory peak injection, 137 dB peak mandatory. But this is written by an idiot um, who doesn't understand noise. Seriously? 135 to 137, I mean, it's such a small difference, you can't guarantee it. So we say 135 mandatory. 140 inside PPE, one event per day, you can't allow that. You're not allowed that. You just must not do that because that's instant hearing damage. And again, that's extraordinary rare. <laughs> so, a few quotes from the HSC to give you an idea of how they think this should be released and how you should deal with it. Health surveillance is a tax on the failure to control noise. They just want you to get below 85. So if you're above 85, there's a cost of having health surveillance, which will be on the And the most important thing about risk assessments is they should have, the report should have an action plan. It's the only reason you're doing it. What am I going to have to do over the next year or two to reduce the risks? Now, the HSC say that two thirds, nearly two thirds of all reports they see are just a waste of money, a waste of time. It's so bad. The standard is so bad. So it's the action plan that's quite often missing. Often you just get tables of results and lots of stuff. But it should be precise action plan. When we do in our reports, there's we have a one to two page summary which says exactly what you should be doing and who should be responsible should be for the good next to that and by when. Because that's the key thing. Um, and employers should expect to use that information to actually make changes to what happens. Unfortunately, there's too much of a checkbox thing. People say, oh, you need to do risk assessment done every two years. You don't. You need to, you need to, to evaluate for two years. If nothing's changed, don't do it. It's a waste of money. It's a placebo. It's telling you what you already know. To give you an idea of what this, what, what this means in practice is uh, a few years ago, uh, an HSC inspector went to a uh, power station and was looking around and saying, here, it's bad, and all sorts of things, the problems, the problems wrong. And so he said, oh, I'm going to have to start getting heavy with you. I want you, I'll give you about six months to sort this out. Okay? And so they went away, he bought some salt, spent thousands and thousands of pounds on a big risk assessment report. And they sent it off to the HSC inspector. And to summarize his letter he sent back, uh, it was saying, let me get this straight. I said you have a noise problem and people are at risk. But what you've done is you spend four months, thousands of pounds, to generate a report that says we have a noise problem. <laughs> exactly this big, with no further forward. That's the thing, they want cash. So it is, if there are solutions, you must implement. You must. The trouble with changing things is it's harder than just getting a report done with this and stuff. <laughs> um, and the regulations is clear the name, this is the Control of work, Noise and Work Regulations. It's due to the concern of controlling noise and not making it. It is hard to overestimate how much of a down the HSC have got on measurement. Because they are just so frustrated by the fact that the whole, most of the noise industry is predicated on measurement. It's just, well, you have a measure noise, measure, 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 measure. Because that's easy. <coughs> Doing changing things is more difficult. So the HC are really, really pissed off with just people measuring stuff. Both hand-eye vibration as well, very similar. 
So it is this thing about you measure what you need to measure and then you must act. Don't keep measuring. Don't repeat risk assessments that haven't got practical information that was controlled. That's part of the process is to control the risk, to reduce the risk. You can get a noise level low enough, there is no risk. <clears throat> so most noise assessments are worth the paper written on. It is compulsory under regulation to carry a noise control audit. You say you've already done that on your site. And fundamentally, noise control audit, it's one of the things that we do is, I've been doing this a long time, but I can walk through virtually any manufacturing facility and a lot of others. I can say, easy, 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 I need to put that one in more detail. That one, there's nothing you can do, you're doomed, I'll give you a real, you are doomed certificate, you'll have to wear BP on that, I can prove it. And that's what you're after, noise control audit, you need to evaluate what the costs will be to reduce the noise levels by certain amounts. It's a cost benefit, cost benefit analysis. Once you've done that, you can decide what's worth doing. In an awful lot of uh, industries, food industry, pharmaceutical industries, um, high hygiene industries where the noise levels are high 80s, you can get down below 85 dBA quite easily, quite cheap. And that saves money and time and reduces risks. So for yourself, financing, you need to know how much it would cost using the best of technology, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. <coughs> um, and a very common thing is, oh, we've got noise problem, let's get some quotes in from noise control equipment and suppliers. Now, if you manufacture an enclosure, every enclosure is every noise problem, the solution to every noise problem is an enclosure. You know, if you manufacture how much every problem is a name, it's that sort of thing. That's wrong. You have to, first off, say, what is the problem? Diagnose the problem, and then maybe get in touch with suppliers who can fix that. And one of the problems is, again, if you're looking at a production line or a, pro or a manufacturing process, there's a tendency to look at it as a box that's generating noise, so you fit another box around it that's not the way getting out. Whereas what you should do is say, this is a process that generates noise. Only parts of it generate noise. How does it generate it? What's generating noise? What part of that process can that be changed as an engine? If you can't do that, then you have to fall back on things palliatives like odors of barriers and stuff. But you need to look at what the contributions and the various sources you need to understand the problem first. And I'm going to talk about diagnosis. And also, people don't really get how much of a health problem noise is. Um, and this is, if you look at manufacturers, for example, um, of noisy kit, you've got a personal policy to sort of. Um, why is not, why is designing in noise production facilities not a high priority? It's not a high priority. Since the regulations came in for noise, there's been virtually no work by manufacturers, generally speaking, on the stuff they make. Kit, noisy kit, they make to reduce noise levels. It's pathetic. And the reason is because there is effective PPD. So in their CE marking, in their uh, manual, it goes so for safe working use using PPD. On the other hand, panel vibration regulations that came at the same time, there is no PPD panel vibration. So over the last 10 or 15 years, the manufacturers have gone a long way to reduce the vibration of their houses. But there's not the same push. And the only thing that's going to push manufacturers to do that is companies like 3M to enforce those policies. I think we do that. When we <coughs> buy equipment, we put a, you know, in our way, use requirements on So what happens, happens if they don't need to do it? Does that, is that, does everyone got that experience? No. No, I don't think they don't get paid. I think we probably have it. No, I, I, I mean, this is the problem. I, I know at the moment, when they put it in here, is today it's for their sound meter because one of the machines is not noisy enough to go on. And so they've, they've done some stuff and it's going back against it to measure it. It's, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if, if the end of the everything else is perfect and like, oh, it's just a little bit over that. I don't know how much they would be like, then we're not having it. Yeah. See, this, this is one of the problems that noise isn't regarded as a serious hazard, it's an afterthought. You know, if, if, if the process, if the machine's giving off cancerous material fumes that people are breathing in, and would you say, oh, that's only a little bit over? If there's only a small chance of electrocuting someone, we are asking that. See what I mean? It's different. But 
what people don't understand, really, as far as health is concerned, the most induced hearing loss, tinnitus is a very serious problem. A third of the population suffers from tinnitus, which is up in the years, and by 70, 70% of people have tinnitus. And that can often be caused by high levels of noise, and it's very, very debilitating. And every year alone, people commit suicide with tinnitus. Also, dementia, noise induced hearing loss, and crucial risk of dementia by 9%. It is the highest modifiable thing, risk for dementia that you can do. It costs the NHS a massive amount of money. It costs, it, it's estimated something like that if you can reduce noise induced hearing, if you can get rid of noise induced hearing loss, it will save the NHS between four and five billion pounds a pound. It's a lot of money. Um, and the insurance industry is paying out, getting on half a billion pounds a year, really. Despite the fact that noise has been noise regulations for decades, it's not what, what's happening now is not working. There's also the cost of PP. Now, one of the interesting things on, on courses is how much, if, 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 if say to a room full of people, right, your, your sites, how much do you spend on hearing protection? Do you know? I think you'd be quite surprised at how expensive it is. Because if you're using earplugs, for example, disposable earplugs, that amount, they're cheap, but it mounts up over here. If you're using um, earmuffs, that's then also good ones on achievements, maintenance, and all these costs. It's an interesting experience to work it out. I mean, we did a job for a bakery about three or four years ago, and we did noise control audit of their whole site. So, look, we reckon if you spend 25 grand, on, on noise control, you could eliminate virtually all your equipment PPE across 90% of your stuff. And the guy said, Well, I'll do that. Because what I just worked out that you spent £23,000 a year on hearing protection. So you'll pay for yourself in less than a year. So that's the sort of sum. It helps to have money. Um, also, there's all the spin off stuff, the hassle, organising things, training, and all the rest of it. <clears throat> And ongoing cost of risk assessments. If you get noise levels down below 85, you don't have to carry out noise risk assessments. And again, people waste a massive amount of money repeating risk assessments when nothing's changed or very little's changed. And, and most organisations don't have to do that. But you know, we know companies who spend like five or six grand a year on the site to get repeat risk assessments and say, well, you've only got two new machines, just measure those, that would take that much to become equipped. You know, why are you spending all this money to tell you what you already know? And a key thing about hearing damage is that risk is direct proportional to noise dose, the total amount of energy going into your ears. So, and I'll be explaining exactly why this is the case in a minute. Every 3 dB of noise, but a 3 decibel increase in noise is a 50% increase in energy, which is a 50% increase in risk. So in other words, if the noise level goes up from 88 to 91, you have doubled the risk. If you reduce the noise from 95 down to 92, you have halved the risk. So, and that applies to any noise level at all, whether the noise level is 100 dBA, whether the noise level is 90. As long as it's above 85, this, this rule applies. So <clears throat> quite often people go, well, noise control is no point because we can't get below 80 or we can't get below 80. But if your noise level is 93 and you get down to 90, you half the risk. You have to do it. So 3 dB reduction is 50%, 3 dB off is 50% reduction of risk, 6 dB is a 75% reduction of risk. If not the noise like 10 dB, it's a 90% reduction of risk. Now this is one of the points that just gets missed all the time. Because you say, okay, look, it's 97. If you get down to 94, it's only going to cost you 400 for it. You've halved the risk, and you're also down to the zone where hearing protection works much better. So, very, very important. <laughs> and the most common mistakes are made as far as noise control programs are concerned is diagnosis. Generally speaking, no diagnosis is carried out. It's not the machine less noisy. Get a box or something, or put a piece of absorb everywhere. And they don't work, no one works out why it's noisy. And lack of engineering knowledge and expertise, very noise control. Um, and diagnosis again, because that's the key thing. 
and lack of knowledge about materials and crops and producing materials. I'm talking about hygiene materials because some of you got uh, hygiene environments as well. <clears throat> um, and using the wrong materials in the wrong way. <clears throat> and there's only a limited number of things you can do as far as source control is concerned. Source control is the ideal. This is engineering control measures which are cheap and effective and can reduce noise at source by modifying the part itself the way it works slightly or various things like that. For aerodynamic noise sources, you've got various types of sensing, and some of you have talked about you've got aerodynamic noise sources, fans, you've got air transport systems, you've got pneumatics. Fundamentally, there is no excuse for unsigned exhausts, and there's an awful lot of bullshit talked about uh, pneumatic noise bottles, exhausts. Oh, you can't. You can't put a science on that because it has back pressure and it doesn't, the machine doesn't work properly. Rubbish. You have zero back pressure science. Um, so I'm talking about that in some detail. Vibration damping, um, which is an engineer, I love it, because this is nowadays steel. It looks like stainless steel, it behaves like stainless steel, it sounds like rubber. So shoot hoppers, vibrating parts of the machine, guards, and so on. A place like this is cheap, there's a company in Newcastle make it. Um, it's cheap, rugged, and hygienic. How many of you have heard of this? See, it's only been around for 45 years. And this is one of the problems people don't know about materials. You know, as an engineer, I, it's, it's brilliant, it's cheap, rugged, hygienic. Well, it's not tonight. I'll be talking about this as well. Um, vibration isolation is preventing the transmission of vibration. Enclosures, the old traditional ones, I'll talk about that to some, to some extent. And modifying air acoustics, which is putting acoustic absorbers on the walls and sealing and so on. But again, high hygiene environments. However, again, knowledge of materials. This is an acoustic absorb that is high hygiene, it can be steam cleaned, it can be washed and stuff. It can be used in clean rooms, which is very, very high hygiene. It's costly, but compared, you know, compared with the conventional but not really. And again, we use this quite a lot in pharmaceutical and food industry, pressure industry, in limited amounts where it's going to be the most good because it can be taken off and cleaned. It's very, very comfortable. So, knowledge about this stuff and how you decide which of these to use, which is most appropriate, what it would cost, that's what I'm going to be talking about. Now.